Dubai is, is one of those uh, cities that um, did capture our imagination for a while and uh, for all the wrong reasons, it seems. Whether as a case study of uh, capitalist uh, exploitation or uh, a land of the super rich, um, what I'll be trying to do tonight is to uh, offer um, a sort of a different perspective uh, based on the re research that I've done. Uh, I hope that this will suggest uh, that there are different sides to the city, which I think uh, would be of benefit, not just for Dubai, uh, but for urbanism in general. And uh, as you will see, my, my interest is in informal urbanism in all its forms uh, and the degree uh, to which this has been uh, expressed in Dubai is truly uh, fascinating. And uh, I would like to begin with uh, this quote. Uh, Michel de Certeau in his widely read The Practice of Everyday Life reminds us that the planner's voyeuristic view from above is in many ways fictional, a simulacrum, and that we need to move closer uh, down below in his words to places of uh, everyday life and daily behavior. He describes that as a form of reading the urban text. And he contrasts two types of cities, a migrational and a planned city. Uh, I was always fascinated by this statement since it really seemed to make uh, uh, much sense. Uh, and so it kind of inspired me to look at uh, the city of Dubai, which uh, I think is uh, in many ways the ultimate migrant city uh, from this perspective. Uh, of course, as uh, <clears throat> is well known, uh, the literature on Dubai emphasizes the city's excessive developments and mega projects. A passing visit would seemingly uh, confirm that uh, Dubai is not a city in the conventional sense, merely a set of cities uh, connected by a network of highways, where there is hardly any pedestrian circulation and everything is geared towards consumption. This is, of course, the planner's view a view from above or from a distance. Here there are no real people, merely passive consumers following the dictates of global capitalism. What I also fa find fascinating on any discussion uh, concerning uh, the city is that, that it is conceived without a proper context. It is surrounded by an endless desert, and it seems to me that the entire urbanization paradigm of the city uh, aims at moving away from the desert in various ways. At the same time, great emphasis is placed on the city's exclusivity, luxury, and even inaccessibility. One of its major landmarks, uh, the Burj Al Arab, is uh, largely inaccessible and can only be entered through a gate. Not this one, but you know, further uh, along. Um, Similarly, many of its attractions, uh, it seems, derive their allure from this. The gated residences of the Palm Jumeirah, for instance, which are manned by security guards and do not allow entry into any of the trunks. Even photography is not allowed, and, and these were taken, you know, uh, quickly. Um, or the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world, which can only, or for the most part, can uh, be seen from a distance uh, but if you want to enter into the building uh, or even get close, you need to purchase a ticket to uh, reach its observation tower or uh, have reservations for dining into one of its exclusive uh, restaurants or rent a room in the Armani Hotel. Uh, while this is true at the level of individual buildings, it acquires a, a much more serious dimension if we take into account movement across the city and its various zones. Here, the city's morphology and its street system preclude any meaningful pedestrian movement or the formation of any substantive public space. Indeed, public gatherings are highly regulated. They take place inside privately owned shopping malls, gated parks, and uh, so on. Yet, this seems to me to be only offering a partial and in many ways a misguided image of the city. This is the planned city, seen uh, from above or from a distance. If we were to truly understand the city of Dubai, or actually any city, uh, we need to move closer to places where everyday life is taking place. There we will find a serious 
uh, of vibrant spaces which offer a sense of comfort and inclusiveness for the city's migrants, uh, thereby creating a migrational city which slips into the planned city, according to Michel de Certeau. And uh, let me now turn to a bit of theory before talking about specific cases. And I'm using here the term uh, little space versus big space. My argument is that because of the financial crisis and perhaps even recent developments concerning uh, the so-called Arab Spring, greater emphasis should be placed on the spaces of the everyday, the little spaces, rather than the iconic and the superlative or the big spaces. By focusing on the spaces of the everyday rather than the abstract spaces of economic flow, I am uh, in many ways responding to a shift in global city research where the emphasis has moved towards establishing uniqueness and differences rather than similarities among cities. Such a focus on the daily practices of city residents resonates with the writings of many influential urbanists such as Jane Jacobs, extolling the virtues of daily life in Greenwich Village uh, or Richard Sennett also talking about these uh, same spaces. They do constitute an idealization and uh, romanticization of course of traditional neighborhood life. Uh, of particular note is also the work of Margaret Crawford who writes on the spatial expressions of informal economies as in street vending and garage sales for example in US cities. She writes that Ro uh, quote, woven into the patterns of everyday life, it is difficult to even uh, discern these places as public space, but that located behind the private, commercial, and domestic realms, they, quote, contain multiple and constantly shifting meaning rather than clarity of function. So in many ways, she's emphasizing the ambiguous uh, nature of these uh, sites. And these theoretical frameworks and depictions of da daily life uh, were done mostly uh, by those in the social sciences, geographers, sociologists, anthropologists, and so on. Uh, but they were also echoed in the work of uh, city planners and architects, such as Kevin Lynch, William White, uh, Jan Gale, and many, many others. And more recently, uh, Quentin Stevens introduced the idea of the ludic city, exploring the ludic or the play potential of city spaces. His focus is on leftover spaces, which are, quote, underdesigned, difficult, and abandoned. These spaces provide, as Stephen puts it, quote, the best opportunities for play precisely because they often do not have a function and their affordances are unknown. They are outside the functional managed environment. Serious uses and meaning are absent. A significant outcome is the presence or existence of an other or hidden city. These interstitial urban zones have been described as offline spaces and lag time places. Christine Boyer distinguishes between a figured city and a disfigured city. The la later are the abandoned segments that surround and interpenetrate the figured city, remaining unimageable and forgotten. The disfigured city is largely uh, invisible and excluded. Such visualization have become an entrenched part of our popular culture to the extent that they have been evoked in novels and films, such as uh, Ramin Bahrani's description of car mechanics living at the margin in Queens, New York, in his 2007 movie uh, Chop Shop. Invariably, as the uh, narrative unfolds, uh, there is a juxtaposition between an impoverished and deteriorating neighborhood, a highway that runs overhead, and the Manhattan skyline in the background, suggesting a distant and inaccessible dream. In my interrogation of Dubai, I'll be relying on these conceptual frameworks as well as adopting some of their methodological approaches. And uh, before I discuss specific case studies uh, and examples, I, I would like to uh, uh, sort of briefly present the, or talk about the city's urban structure and uh, how it evolved, uh, because I think it has some bearing on uh, uh, our understanding of some of the sites that I will be uh, discussing. 
And uh, Dubai's origins are uh, well known and go far, as far back as 1822 uh, when this map was published. Uh, this is the first recognizable map of what was then a mere fishing village uh, whose inhabitants, according to a British officer at the time and in true uh, sort of colonial-like fashion, uh, were less inclined to plundering, were a friendly folk and, quote, stood in awe of the English. Uh, the city uh, grew significantly since then, and uh, here is uh, an image of Dubai's uh, first master plan, published in 1959. Uh, uh, and this pl uh, plan was prepared by uh, the British architect at that time, John Harris, uh, who presented it, presented it to the ruler, uh, Sheikh Rashid. Uh, much of what we see today uh, goes back uh, to that plan. But there have been also been many changes, of course. And what is particularly interesting about this uh, original vision is that John Harris attempted to preserve the original city in uh, Bar Dubai and uh, Deira. Uh, and of, uh, for those of you who are familiar uh, with the city, the, the city of Dubai is divided into two parts. Uh, here we have Deira, here is Bar Dubai, and here is the uh, Arabian or the Persian, you know, Gulf, um, and uh, uh, this is the creek. It's kind of a water inlet that divides the city into two. So this is the original city right here and right here, and Harris tried to preserve uh, this uh, city and just to extend uh, outwards. Now, uh, that hasn't been realized, and uh, indeed much of the original, original city has been demolished except for very uh, few uh, parts that uh, still exist. Uh, this is the situation uh, we have uh, today, uh, uh, kind of a figure ground diagram, a largely disjointed city composed of uh, fragments and where there is no clear and coherent urban fabric. The city has in fact expanded along a linear corridor uh, uh, this way uh, towards the Jabal Ali port along the border with Abu Dhabi. The original city uh, which we see right here, uh, is of course uh, very tiny and small compared to uh, the rest of uh, the city. Also, uh, much has been said about the city's population and estimates vary uh, from 5 to 20 percent of the city are local residents um, and among expatriates, South Asians dominate with about 61 percent alone coming from one region, which is uh, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. Um, I should note that these numbers are from the 2005 uh, census. Uh, there hasn't been a census since, and uh, there are no immediate plans for having one uh, now or in the future. Um, however, uh, looking at these numbers, which still to, to, to a large degree are, are valid today, uh, we have a very skewed structure. And this is made even more tenuous by uh, the temporary arrangement for uh, many of these uh, expatriates and people who live there. Uh, many can only stay for a few years and uh, they then need to leave. Now, uh, this population structure has led to uh, a very unique urban setting, a city of transient residents living in hidden neighborhoods whose alleyways reveal a different dynamic than the rest of the city. Uh, walking through these alleyways opens up different vistas and surprise encounters. One may find outdoor seating arrangements, empty during the day, but lively places of exchange in the evening. The exclusive city of Dubai is far removed from these sites. Now, from the preceding, it is obvious that I'm trying to uh, go beyond the city as spectacle and to present, uh, shall we say, a, a more humane face. Uh, in order to do this, I've been researching these sites uh, on and off since 2004, with the overall objective of uh, mapping and documentation. Uh, some results of these uh, studies were published in, in uh, some journals, such as the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, Architectural Theory Review, among many others. And uh, I will now briefly uh, present some of the work that I have done in the past and then talk about 
uh, some of the things and stuff that I'm working on uh, right now. And uh, let me uh, begin with this map. I, I apologize, not very clear, but uh, as I indicated, I'm interested in mapping uh, the gathering sites for the city's migrants, as well as identifying signs of resistance to the hegemonic quality of the built environment, which does not encourage the formation of such spaces. Uh, through a process of ethnographic reading, I have attempted to develop a taxonomy of these sites, constituting the city's little spaces. These informal public places are located in proximity to the city center, the original uh, city, which are right here. These are the areas I've looked at, and of course, this is uh, uh, the expansion of the city towards the border with uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, here is a close-up view of the previous map, and uh, I've identified the sites that I've studied. Uh, and uh, they are uh, the uh, Karama, uh, Satwa, uh, the Baniya Square. Um, and also, if you note here, this small uh, area in red, this is uh, a district called Horalans, which is uh, what I'm looking at right now and which I will be talking about in more detail a little bit later. Um, now, as I mentioned, in my previous uh, research, I identified uh, four sites of informal use, and they are uh, Baniya Square, which is right here, and, and most of these sites are located next to bus stops and, and so on. So uh, one of them is Baniya Square, uh, the Rubeiba area, um, and uh, Satwa, and the district of uh, Karama uh, right here. Uh, in order to uh, study, st or while I was studying these sites, uh, I employed a methodology of participant observation, which entailed observation of activities, uh, taking field notes, interviews with uh, selected informants, and of course, photography. Uh, it was a kind of immersion within the setting, very much related to ethnographic practices. And uh, rather than talking about uh, each of these cases, let me just briefly uh, point out some of the main issues and findings uh, related to uh, activities, as well as uh, the urban character of these uh, settings. Now, as I mentioned, these sites have major bus stops, which draw in people from all over the city, contributing to the crowded uh, feeling, particularly on weekends. These bus stops are surrounded by commercial establishments, catering to the constantly moving transient users. In close proximity to these uh, bus stops are zones which act as a major hangout for passers-by. People simply stand, talk, and watch others. And by, uh, through interviews and uh, uh, talking, it, uh, uh, it was revealed that people come to these settings on a regular basis to interact with others and meet friends and receive news from back home. And in fact, uh, people who come to these sites are not just from the immediate surroundings, but they also come from uh, labor camps, uh, sometimes from uh, cities, other cities as well. Um, so these places do serve uh, a very important communication function. People, users of these sites, know that they will find relatives and uh, uh, their compatriots. And uh, one of the interesting things about these sites is the utilization of leftover spaces and sidewalks, as can be seen here, for example, next to the uh, Robeiba bus stop. Close by is uh, another major gathering area, which serves as a meeting point both for residents as well as visitors who come from other emirates and uh, labor camps, as I just mentioned. And people gather in groups along the edges of the space, which is very typical of any group gathering in public spaces. Uh, many simply stand and watch others, while there is a constant stream of pedestrians walking by. Street corners become sites for impromptu activities. For instance, uh, here this lottery card vendor set up a temporary stand, which in turn became a kind of attraction point, generating activities uh, around it. And here, uh, through uh, time-lapse photography, I'm trying to capture the dynamic flow of activities in the space. And I'm also 
trying to show the informal nature of these uh, activities. These places were not really planned for any of this to take place. They are merely meant for circulation. But of course, people have uh, taken them over in many ways and transformed them. Uh, back alleys, hidden corners behind uh, street signs become sites of gathering, allowing for exchanges and interactions to take place away from the prying eyes of authorities. Around these bus stops, different activities spring up, catering to the specific users who mostly hail from the Indian subcontinent. For instance, here we have a newspaper stand displaying magazines and newspapers in Hindi, Urdu, and so on. In this way, they act as a kind of uh, reinforcement of ethnic identity vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the rest of the city. And uh, let me now talk a little bit about uh, the urban uh, character of these sites. Uh, highlighting the transnational connection is uh, the ubiquitous presence of uh, money exchange operators uh, who prominently display their presence through large signs. These stores tend to be the biggest and sometimes the most attractive. Uh, there is also a large presence of ethnic restaurants serving all sorts of food, in this case, uh, Pakistan. Um, in addition to informal modes of communication, uh, there are, of course, other uh, uh, advanced uh, means as well. For example, uh, there is a heavy use of mobile phones, which uh, some of these workers have. Uh, there are also a number of internet cafes, which are close by uh, and heavily used. And interestingly, there are also people who uh, sell talk time on their mobile phones to others who, who don't have uh, uh, who don't have a, who don't have one uh, or they sell you know phone cards and, and stuff like that uh, in this way ties to home countries are retained and these spaces uh, become settings where such transnational connections are retained another uh, fascinating phenomena uh, is what i have called migratory traces um, and here, the notion of independence and resistance, marking one's ethnic ethnicity, can of course be established through a variety of means, direct or indirect. A prominent feature observable in many parts of the city, uh, on walls and lampposts, are flyers written by residents, advertising rooms and apartments for their compatriots. In many instances, they specifically state a preferred nationality, gender, eating habits, and religion. For example, one uh, uh, ad ad flyer would read uh, that a person is seeking a Keralite, non-smoking, Muslim, executive, male, bachelor. Uh, so very, very specific uh, to uh, targeting, you know, very small number of, of people. Now, I should note that this uh, type of advertisement is, is actively fought by the municipality, and there are frequent campaigns targeting these. And I've even seen uh, local residents taking many of these down in, in uh, a complete fury and anger as they are seen as uh, a blight on, on the beautiful city. Uh, graffiti is prevalent as well, and, and uh, you see that in, in the lower uh, income districts of uh, Karama and uh, Satwa. And uh, they do, in some instances, express political views uh, related to conflicts in the Indian subcontinent. Um, so there might be a political overtone, but you don't see much of those. Um, but these writings are not along the visible squares or spaces, but they are hidden and tucked away in alleyways. They offer, uh, I think, an interesting counterpoint to the carefully groomed image of the city. Uh, the district of Karama, a kind of middle income uh, neighborhood in, in, uh, in Dubai, offers some really interesting displays of ethnicity. Although its uh, architecture is kind of uh, anonymous and nondescript, however, this anonymity is overcome by uh, a variety of discrete displays signaling the ethnicity of occupants. These include, for the most part, uh, lights, uh, for example, celebrating the Indian uh, Diwali festival, uh, placed in balconies and other outdoor areas. 
the results of uh, this part of the investigation, uh, I placed them on, uh, on a website called Hidden Dubai, uh, which contains uh, images of some of these places that I talked about, and also uh, um, uh, uh, there is some elaboration and further discussion of some other sites as well. And um, also some of my uh, work has been published in a series of books uh, planning Middle Eastern cities and the evolving Arab city, uh, as well as a book on Dubai that was published in 2010. And also let me mention in that context uh, a, a recent issue uh, on informal urbanism uh, published in a journal, UK-based journal called Built Environment, uh, where we looked at this notion of informal urbanism in different contexts throughout the world, uh, Rio de Janeiro, Nigeria, uh, Stuttgart, um, and my particular contribution in this issue was uh, concerned the city of Abu Dhabi. All right, now, my last case uh, involves uh, a work currently in progress, uh, where I've been trying to systematize uh, my <clears throat> observations and present it within uh, an overall effort of mapping the city. And I decided to study the area of Hora Lands, a low-income district in Dera, Dubai, with a high concentration of residents. Hora Lands was originally uh, planned as a neighborhood in the 1970s for locals uh, who have since moved out. It is now do dominated by inhabitants from South Asia. And looking at the city's 1959 master plan that I showed some time ago by John Harris, one can see that the area was nothing more than a patch of sand. It basically would have been right here, uh, right on the outskirts of the city. Uh, following a policy of constructing housing for nationals, the district was designed similar to other newly built areas in the city, such as Satwa, with identical one-story buildings, and, and they call these buildings uh, Arab-style house. Some of those uh, uh, original buildings still remain, while others have been torn to make way for multi-story apartment blocks. At the moment, the district is divided into two parts, east and west. The eastern part, which would be here, is considered uh, the western part, I'm sorry, which would be right here, uh, is considered to be deteriorating, with its inhabitants uh, mostly consisting of low-income workers from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India. Population is about 60,000 uh, within a relatively small size area, making it one of the most densely populated districts in Dubai. Uh, streets are arranged on a grid system, and are relatively well maintained, with the exception of a few back alleys that uh, have not been uh, upgraded or uh, paved. Horaland Street, which was the main area that uh, I investigated, is a major commercial thoroughfare um, running uh, through the length of the neighborhood and is considered a main point for uh, local residents as well as uh, visitors from other places. This street contains various outlets, such as restaurants, grocery stores, electrical appliances, and so on. Uh, my study in this area is part of a three-year investigation uh, of such sites in Dubai. Um, and uh, I decided to start with Horalands, uh, given its high concentration of low-income users from the Indian subcontinent, high level of usage in its main commercial street, and also for being an important component of the city's urban growth. And what I'm showing now is, is part of the research that we did uh, last year, and it will continue over the next uh, two years. And uh, in this uh, study, me and my uh, research assistants, uh, we were also experimenting with uh, new technologies involving GIS systems, uh, high resolution photography, and video capture. Uh, we are aiming at conducting a meticulous survey of the neighborhood's physical characteristics, studying its land use and morphology, and the extent to which activities are supported by the built environment. And as I mentioned, I'm, I'm using uh, the help of uh, student assistants who are, uh, for the most part, uh, residents uh, from Dubai, and their involvement, of course, adds another 
a very interesting dimension to the study as well as they are able to bring their own insights into the study, uh, be able to uh, talk to some of the people we were uh, uh, sort of observing and investigating because they know uh, the language. And uh, one of the things we were interested in is the uh, what is called the diurnal rhythm of Horalan's street, trying to find activities that take place over a certain amount of time. Uh, and we did that through a technique called behavioral mapping. Uh, central points of gathering were uh, being identified, as well as locating the main actors using the space. Uh, the outcome is envisioned to be a series of maps outlining the architectural, uh, urban, and behavioral character of the street, thereby revealing its inner life. And what you see here are uh, sort of the, the, some of the maps which um, uh, students uh, use to identify the main actors and uh, activities in the street. And we would uh, we establish kind of like a code for different activities, um, and uh, uh, these would be manually coded on these maps. Um, and to establish sort of validity to uh, what was being recorded, we also used photographs uh, which document the different activities that take place within that specific time frame. Um, this would be a verification of sorts for what is recorded manually. Uh, then using a, a GIS program, uh, we would digitize these codes into the, the program. Uh, location of people are plotted. In addition, we would also uh, uh, write down the various attributes uh, right, uh, right here, such as gender, ethnicity type, and length of activity, and so on. All of these would be identified and subjected to further analysis. Now here, uh, not sure if this would be very clear, but uh, this is uh, a figure ground uh, drawing of, of the area. Uh, this is Horal Hans Street right here. And um, uh, not sure if it's very clear, but you can see the preliminary map of all the activities that took place on a Saturday. And uh, I plotted here all stationary activities which took place during that day to identify main sites of gathering. Obviously, there is more information and further analysis and graphic uh, representation will take place. Um, here in these graphs, locales of stationary activities are pl plotted across the different time segments that we used for mapping, starting from 9 a.m. up until 8 p.m. in the evening. And uh, here are all the activities plotted simultaneously that took place during that day. And as you can see from the map here, uh, some parts are uh, more heavily used than others. Um, so as a way to measure density of activities across space, uh, we did something called kernel density map analysis, leading to a heat index. And the analysis shows that uh, stationary activities throughout Saturday are spread throughout the street, although they tend to be centered on two spots. One is right here and the other one right here. Uh, this one here, uh, we tried to find out why this is so heavily used. Uh, for obvious reasons, one contains a large tree which, uh, under which people tend to sit all day, uh, while the other has a, a kind of a pharmacy which closes early and people can sit there without uh, being bothered. Now, uh, prior to identifying these uh, hotspots, I decided to look at one particular corner in that street, uh, which we called the Peshawar Street Corner, uh, named after a restaurant there, which seemed to be quite active. Um, and uh, we used a time-lapse video uh, for this. So basically, I set up a video camera uh, and recorded from one angle throughout the entire day on Friday. And uh, sequences were shot at half-hour intervals for five to f four to five minutes each. Uh, the resultant clips were combined, and by speeding up the sequence, a sense of how the space transformed throughout the day is captured. So let's see if we can get this to work.
So uh, these are, uh, this is uh, 5 a.m. Um, the corner is kind of uh, busy because uh, people just had left Friday prayer. Uh, 5.30 a.m. things are uh, slowing down uh, a little bit. Uh, by 7.30 p.m., uh, people are beginning to gather and also to have uh, breakfast at that uh, restaurant. Uh, this is right before the Friday prayer. So uh, the, the uh, uh, restaurant or, or is sort of uh, closing down. Um, and uh, people are beginning to go to the mosque, which is uh, nearby, uh, preparing for prayer, of course. Um, so this is around noon time. So things, of course, are uh, slowing down. This is kind of interesting. Not sure if I can. Uh, well. Now, as the evening progresses, uh, the corner. Uh, that uh, becomes more active and more people are beginning uh, to uh, uh, sit there and to uh, hang out along uh, the street post and the lamp signs. Um, and uh, it begins to be quite active uh, later on towards the evening uh, around 7 p.m., 8 p.m., uh, and so on. All right, so that continues, of course, throughout the night. Uh, I plan going there uh, midnight uh, at one point as well. Um, to further analyze this, I uh, sort of experimented by mapping the activities and movements of people in this corner uh, during uh, a four-minute sequence. Uh, each and, uh, 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 and every activity was meticulously counted and plotted, uh, and I created a sequence of movement. Now, obviously, this is still uh, at an early experimental stage, but perhaps there is some potential to further study this. And, and here are all the activities and movements uh, during this four-minute sequence, which uh, were plotted showing both stationary activities as well as people moving uh, across the space. And density of use, I think, is, is uh, captured in, in some way. The previous graph is a bit static, so I was interested in trying to capture movement as well, graphically representing networks, groupings, uh, and so on, as people move across space. Uh, so this diagram is, is a first uh, attempt at doing this, kind of like a sketch. Uh, and the role of fixed features, doorways, stoops, and lampposts, um, is of course very important uh, in uh, activities that take place there. Now, preliminary findings do suggest the urban vitality of the street as it acts as a node for its inhabitants. Surprisingly, it also is a meeting point for elderly locals who frequent one of its cafes on a regular basis. These are residents uh, or previous residents of this area who live now in, in the, on the city's outskirts, but who still come there to sit on the corner more or less all day. Uh, some places, such as the Peshawar uh, restaurant, are known throughout the city and as a result acquire an almost iconic status. Located along a corner, uh, it acts as a node, drawing residents and outsiders who interact in front of this store. Such sites defy, uh, I believe, the typical narrative of Dubai as a lifeless city without a soul. And I will now conclude this talk uh, by first showing you a scene from India. And uh, I've been talking about informality, claiming and contesting public space, issues that are present throughout the world. Yet in the Gulf, things are different for some reason. At the beginning of the 2008 movie Slumdog Millionaire, under a pulsating music rhythm, the camera swoops down on Mumbai taking us through the city slums, breathlessly following the movie's protagonist as he moves along the city's teeming alleyways, snaking his way through its hidden spaces. This scene, in all its vitality, 
and dynamism captures the essence of the modern urban condition. The existence of a teeming city, an other, what architect Rahul Mehrotra calls a kinetic city, a city of movement, temporality, and transience, fully alive, a living, breathing organism. Such scenes and movies shape our urban imaginary. They suggest a certain urbanity or cityness that seems to be a model of sorts for all those aspiring to be the new urban centers of the world. But this urban imaginary is unthinkable in the gleaming, immaculate urban centers of the Gulf. The desire uh, for order and control overrides any no notions for an informal yet viable alternative urban order. Yet even when the desire for control seems to supersedes everything, it is a thin veneer. Going beyond this, one finds another world filled with a sense of urbanity, spaces that appear to be occupied and used where a sense of time is visible and palpable. It also demonstrates that people are not passive. The built environment does not have a deterministic quality in spite of what planners may envision. And what I've attempted to show is that city residents display a certain resilience uh, in spite of what uh, appears to be uh, an oppressive and restrictive context. Moreover, the sheer fact that locales in the city are almost hidden and are known by word of mouth indicates that they exist outside a specific geography. Abdumalik Simon, an urban sociologist, within the context of African cities, notes that such sites have, quote, no specific location, but yet can still be located. These are ephemeral spaces given significance by its inhabitants through sheer proximity and density. The street, as Simon puts it, acts as a switch, a conduit for something else. Through this, the lives of migrants acquires meaning, and they are able to retain uh, vital binds that enhance their lives. These are not unsightly gatherings that should be relocated, relocated to the fringes and the margin. They are critical in maintaining a livable and healthy cities. And it is only in the little spaces that a true urbanity can be found unencumbered and unhindered from the prying eyes of others. And thank you very much.